Architecture school can be an intimidating place and is often known for long hours, harsh critiques and a toxic culture of pulling all-nighters. Besides learning about things like sustainability, architectural history and professional practice, just learning what good design is in and of itself can be a difficult thing to wrap your head around. This is because as individuals, it's something that we perceive subjectively according to our own personal taste. However, if you're a designer, basing your designs on personal aesthetic preference alone isn't really going to get you that far. So in this video, I thought I'd show you how I go about this challenge. I'm going to do something a little bit different and give you guys a tour of my fifth year design project for a market and winery building on the remote volcanic island of Pico, which is one of the nine islands of the Portuguese archipelago, the Azores. This project actually got nominated for the RIBA silver medal back in 2015, when I was studying my masters at the Kingston School of Art in London, something that's reserved for the top two design projects of a university's final year group. And of course, if you've got a short attention span, I've got you covered and I've left timestamps down in the video description. So feel free to skip around or to skip ahead as you please. I didn't really realize this at the time, but I was working to something that I'm going to call a design narrative framework, which I suppose is basically a clear and distinct strategy for convincing clients, tutors, and judging panels to appreciate the work that I've done. And if I'm honest, when I look back at all of the work I've done, either at school or in the workplace, I can probably attribute most of my success to this particular way of thinking. This approach goes further than thinking merely about pretty or pragmatic architecture and integrates design narrative, which in my experience is broken down into five key ingredients. The first is history, so referencing the merits of a location and its culture. Second is context and local vernacular, which is basically just using the local architecture and landscape to inform your proposal. Then there's generosity and thinking about how the design can give back to the place it's located. Sustainability in minimizing environmental impact. And then finally, efficiency through making your budget stretch as far as it possibly can. To kick things off, when doing any design, it requires a lot of research. And this is something that you're going to want to show any client or judging panel in order to convince them. A bit like showing you're working out to a teacher when answering a maths problem at school. So to begin, you're going to want to show that you thoroughly understand the location and the brief. My project was located in the small town of Madalena on the island of Pico. Chances are, like me, you've never heard of this place before, but it's probably one of the most spectacular places that I've ever been to in my entire life. Pico is one of the nine islands of the archipelago of the Azores, which is an autonomous region of Portugal that sits right in the middle of the Atlantic Ocean at the underwater junction of the American, African and Eurasian tectonic plates, which manifests itself as an enormous underwater mountain range. And at this particular junction, it bursts above sea level in the form of these nine volcanic islands. Pico and its volcano, Mount Pico, is actually the highest point in all of Portuguese territory at 2,351 meters above sea level. However, when this is measured from its base on the ocean floor, Mount Pico can actually be considered one of the tallest mountains on the entire planet. Also, because it's an ominous fire-breathing volcano, the molten lava basalt fields meant that early settlers found it near impossible for the growth of cereal crops at an industrial scale, simply due to a shortage of soil. However, because these settlers were Christian, they needed wine for their Sunday service, which prompted a discovery of the island's unique ability for producing grapes by inserting vines into small cracks in the hard basalt stone. This alone was hard enough without the harsh Atlantic winds and accompanying sea salt spray. So the early settlers then protected the vines by putting up dry stone basalt walls around them, otherwise known as curai. Unfortunately, this is where the story takes a turn. And because these settlers didn't have pesticides, a plague of phylloxera wiped out almost the entirety of the island's vines at the end of the 19th century, leaving these incredibly unique vineyards to deteriorate and be forgotten. Due to only a few areas being preserved, this caused areas of the island to gain UNESCO World Heritage status in 2004. And with this background of historical research, it provides several points of reference for design in taking cues from the dry stone basalt walls and using the early Christian influence as key points of direction. 
The hypothetical client for the project's brief is actually the island's single cooperative winery, who we got to know when visiting the island. The winery gathers the majority of the grapes from the smaller vineyards across the island in order to contribute towards larger scale wine production. And like any small business, it was looking to grow and contribute to the island's economy in the coming years. Back then, this resulted in grants for the recovery of the island's lost vineyards, which were covered in a dense overgrown thicket. This meant that increased grape cultivation would then be beyond the capabilities of the current facility, resulting in the need for a new premises. As a part of the brief, we were required to scout out hypothetical sites for our projects, and the empty site that I chose was located at the edge of the island's main town of Madalena, in close proximity to the island's main harbour and bridging the boundary between the town and the UNESCO protected vineyards. The site was being used as overflow for aggregate storage, with big aggregate piles scattered adjacently to a cluster of industrial buildings. It became clear early on that with all of the history of the basalt vineyard walls and the edge of town location, it was an obvious opportunity to translate the historic and material reference of the walls into the design of the architecture. This was translated into a pair of pragmatic linear buildings that served to define the edge of the town much like a city wall, whilst hiding the unsightly industrial buildings from the picturesque UNESCO protected vineyards beyond. After considering some of the island's history and the industrial context of the site, it was also worth considering how the building could give back and enhance the local community and neighbourhood. One thing that was hindering the production of local farmers on the island was also the growing presence of supermarkets and imported goods. There was no local market on Pico, and the closest ones were all on the other islands, so this presented an opportunity to combine the function of a winery with a sheltered civic structure which would provide a place for hosting a weekly market. This would not only aim to foster a sense of community, but also provide Madalena a tourist destination to aid the island's economic growth. With this approach that considers the island's surrounding context and history, whilst also acknowledging the local community, there's now a way to use these constraints as a means to make the architectural design work as hard as possible. If you have a mountain of cash behind you, it's not really that hard to make something impressive architecturally. So, in this case, I assume that the client of the cooperative winery didn't really have that much to spend, meaning that it was important for the project to work hard for every single additional square metre. And with such a remote location, importing exotic materials is expensive, However, by looking at the way that things were done locally on the island, it became clear that the industrial concrete vernacular was the most suitable form of construction, most likely due to the difficulties of transporting large prefabricated steel beams or timber panels to the island. The design of the two structures was also informed by one of the oldest forms of marketplace in world civilization, the Stoa of Attalus in the Athenian Agora. Its long porticos informed the proposal to create not merely just a market and winery, but also a place of meeting on the island, with an explicit civic presence. Here you can see that this adds just another layer of history and meaning by intertwining an iconic classical reference to an already rich history on the island. And the proposal aims to be like the Stoa by creating an architectural landmark and becoming a distinct part of the town's identity, and hopefully lasting many generations to come. Despite hoping that future generations might love my designs as much as classical Greek architecture, it may be somewhat myopic and short-sighted to design buildings purely upon a presumption that its function will never change in the years to come. This would not only be short-sighted, but it would also be unsustainable due to the construction waste that occurs when a building can no longer be adapted for reuse. So I decided that the design of the concrete frame would allow for the design to be adapted to suit various needs for the island as it grows, such as providing the perfect structural skeleton for flats, shops and offices. Because the budget would not realistically allow for sustainable technologies such as expensive heat recovery systems and solar panels, the best way to make sure that the building was as sustainable as possible was to first engineer in flexibility for future adaptation, and second to reduce embodied carbon during construction by using the most readily available durable materials on the island. So with these principles now laid out, you can now see how this framework is now integrated into the design. 
The building is entered from the island's coastal road that connects the town's harbour with the rest of the island. You're greeted by a start of a long portico which gently ramps up the site with the market hugging the side closest to the town. This portico directs you to make a pilgrimage up a long staircase with clear story windows at the end. As you make your way up the portico, you reach a wine bar and cafe which is beneath views facing Mount Pico, which also serves as a place to showcase the local wines and gastronomy. This is at the intersection with the parallel winery building, which draws visitors to view the UNESCO World Heritage Site of the historic vineyards beyond, as well as the epic black basalt coastline. From this belvedere, you're led to tour the fully functional cooperative winery that processes the island's unique tasting grapes, which interestingly have a much higher sugar content and resulting alcohol content due to the harsh conditions. As wine tourism is a big socio-economic factor of the brief, the architecture looks to work with light and compression to provide an engaging spatial experience for visitors, whilst taking cues from the island's churches to create ethereal moments of drama, which concludes at a dramatic tasting room, echoing the architectural layout of a church and its altar. As I mentioned before, the production of grapes on the island was deeply rooted in Christianity, where settlers undoubtedly were seeking divine protection from the forces of nature. So at the end of the journey through the building, it brings you to focus in on the island's produce, whilst echoing the history and culture through the architecture. So hopefully, after all of that, you guys can see how from this particular project, a design narrative framework of history, context, generosity, sustainability, and efficiency can really make your architectural designs more compelling when presenting them to a client or an audience. I actually had a lot more fun making this video than I expected, and it was quite nice to revisit this project that was now over five years ago, and it's made me think about how much I've learned since then, and how much I'd love to have a go at recreating some of these drawings, especially after all of the experience I've gained over the past few years. This brings me to a quick word from today's sponsor, Skillshare, which is also a great place to visit if you're interested in developing other foundational design skills, such as sketching, CAD, or Photoshop. Skillshare is an online learning community with quite literally hundreds of inspiring classes for creative and curious people. On Skillshare, you can explore new skills, deepen existing passions, and get lost in creativity. And you can check out other classes too, like those on photography, cooking, animation, coding, and much more. Back in 2015, I made a lot of the visuals from my project mainly through Photoshop, as it's a crucial aspect of creating architectural visualizations. So you might get a lot of value from classes like this one by Jonas DeRoe on digital painting concept landscapes, which goes over valuable techniques for creating convincing and dramatic concept imagery. Skillshare is curated specifically for learning, meaning that there are no ads and they're always launching new premium classes, so it's easy to stay focused and follow wherever your creativity takes you. And it's less than $10 a month with an annual subscription. But in case you fancy taking your design skills to the next level today, the first 1,000 of my subscribers to click the link in the video description below will get a free trial of premium membership so you can explore your creativity. Also, let me know if revisiting a few of my old images is something that you might be interested in seeing too, as aside from design narrative, the techniques that you use to represent your work is equally as fun and valuable. Also, in case you're interested at looking at my master's project in a little bit more detail, I've linked my RIBA silver medal nomination in a link below, as well as another project I led whilst employed, which came top four of an international RIBA design competition. This video has been a little different from my usual ones, so hopefully you guys enjoyed it, as well as learning a little bit more about me and my background. And of course, drop me a comment below if there's anything you found especially helpful, or if there's anything you thought that I missed. And finally, a big thank you if you've made it to the end of the video, and if you're new here, you might like to check out some of my other videos, like the minimalist extension that I designed for our family home. Once again, thank you guys so much for watching, and I'll see you in the next one.